Good morning. Morning, friends. Can you hear me? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Very good morning to you. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear good me? morning, everyone. Morning, everyone. I was just trying to see how audible. Good morning, ma'am. Morning, morning. All right. All I wanted was to know whether people can hear me through my microphones, through my earbuds. And yes, uh, you're audible. You know whether we are on uh, all right, everyone. How are we today? Doing fine, Matt. All right. Uh, all right. So let's uh, shall we begin? Sharp 10 o'clock. Yes, ma'am. Right. Who do we have with us today? Who do we have? Okay, uh, I just like to know uh, from the from everyone over here, um, other than the notes that we have that we've been given, the books that we've been given, are we referring for our own interest to anything else that might enhance our learning? Yes, no. Yes, ma'am, we are. Yeah, right. What are we referring to? What are we referring to? Uh, ma'am, we are referring to management journals, management journals like uh, Sloan Management Review, Harvard Business Review, these things. And there are certain on certain topics that we are, mm -hmm. we are looking up uh, the internet to find uh, the write-ups on the topic. That we okay. are going through. That we are going through. Very nice. Very, very good. So that, uh, you know, we also, uh, you know, we can enhance our learning. We get a little more knowledge. Uh, mm. Just for uh, all of you to you know, do something more than what you can do. I thought I'll show you that this is one book which I too am referring to. This is by, uh, the name of the book is Effective Training by... Phoenix Blanchard and James Tacker, James W. Tacker. It's a big book. I understand that all of you are working. It may not be possible for, for all of you to get access to your uh, books from the library. But any bit of additional learning that you can get always helps to, you know, to make our concepts robust. Uh, 
and training being such an interesting field, it's always nice to read a little more about it. That's one. Uh, secondly, uh, today's generation, I mean, all of us today wouldn't depend only on books. There are so many other resources on the internet, there are YouTube videos. You can always refer to them. All right? Uh, and uh, yeah, you want to say something? May I request that uh, you rename your uh, Zoom ID with your name instead of me knowing about a phone number or about what kind of instrument you have for connection. It always helps to connect better. If I know your name, I can see it here, and then we can talk. Right? Uh, so shall we start? Shall we begin? Yeah, uh, today, uh, the last in the last class, if you remember, if one of us have uh, I mean recall what we did, we looked at behaviorism. We looked at behaviorism as a learning, as a learning, I would call it philosophy, or as a learning concept, or you can also call it as a learning theory, right? We looked at behaviorism. We looked at something called operand conditioning, which is the uh, Skinner's theory where he said that, uh, you know, you, you can actually, uh, I wouldn't call it enhance, but you can elicit behavior from your learners or you can get your learners to behave in a particular manner by using something called reinforcement or something called reward and punishment. Am I right, friends? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, am I right? We said we can look at reward and punishment as a means to elicit behavior, to get people to behave in a particular manner. Now, when I say getting when you to get people to behave in a particular manner, most of us are parents and uh, all of us do things to get our children to do things for us or to learn or to pick up habits as a way of life, right? So right from childhood, you say, you, you learn this, you have your milk, then you'll get your chocolates or uh, you don't take your milk, then you will not get to go down to play. So these are things that uh, we use to elicit behavior and in due course of time these become ways of doing things for our children. And this goes on till the children become teens and it goes on till the children never grow up. You know? So you are telling your teen that uh, if you come back on time today, then I will buy you that dress which you wanted from H&M or from Zara, right? And uh, because she likes that particular outfit so much, she will ensure that she comes back home on time, whatever timeline you've set for her. So these are rewards and stimuli, uh, re uh, rewards and punishment stimuli that you use to get people to learn. So why are we discussing this over here? We are looking at, we are going to be looking at how do we apply these to the training domain. And this was where one of our friends over here suggested that we look at examples. And friends, since I promised you that uh, I'll give you an example each for uh, what we did, what we do in au pair and conditioning, I'll start right from there. Is this, is this slide visible to all of you? Yes, ma'am. You can, right? Uh, I've tried to incorporate examples from the corporate world as much as I can. However, if you feel you have a better example, you're welcome to share that. So, so quickly, a little of uh, slide usage, slide usage. So looking at, we said, the four types of operand conditioning techniques. And there, uh, there's going to be some degree of repetition because uh, 
We had already done this the last time, but here we are again reinforcing our learning or making our learning more robust by providing an example for each of these type of uh, operant conditioning techniques. So one, you're saying you're using a positive reinforcer. When you say you're using a positive reinforce to drive home a certain behavior, uh, it's like your boss adds a reward. He says that you do a good job, uh, you are going to get a bonus of uh, a lakh of rupees uh, at the end of this quarter and also praises you. He says, good job, Rita. Wonderful. Excellent. And let me laud you for this. All right? Just the way all of you, sometimes I see you clap. You applaud. So that applause becomes an addition of a reward and a bonus. So you're using positive reinforcers. Is that a good example? All right? Uh, the second one, we looked at what is called as negative reinforcers. Now, friends, uh, look at this. When you're saying in a positive reinforcement, you're adding a reward. In a negative reinforcement, you're actually, you take away a punishment, something that's unpleasant, something that's, uh, can someone give me an example of something that you do, which is, this is unpleasant. You think of it as a punishment. Something that is like, okay, oh God, why do I have to do this? And it's a punishment. I don't like this, this penalty which the company imposes. Anyone? Come on. Uh, yeah, yes. so I, I would like to take this up. So sure. I feel your there will be... Your name? Yeah, Pile Yes, Pile Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, so there in certain companies there will be certain restrictions, right? So related to some safety. So maybe those safety reasons, uh, safety uh, things will go plus one step. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have to, so there there is one of the organization uh, in which I work. So mm -hmm. where the safety was a good thing, obviously, but. Uh, the point was even it was like uh, at a certain point it was way too much because if we are using stairs we are supposed to use hold the handrails basically so if you are not holding the handrails it is getting reported to the manager if it is visible by somebody else right hmm. so those kind of things imposing hmm. something uh, which is there which is way too much yeah. so yeah. okay okay uh can I, would you allow me to differ with you in a, in a yes, small sure. way? Yeah. Sure. Um, I wouldn't take away safety standards, uh, you know, for the sake of reinforcing as a negative reinforcer. Safety standards are sacrosanct. They go beyond compliance. They involve human life. All right. Uh, so may yes, of course, using a rail, uh, holding on to a rail uh, might be unpleasant for some people. Yes, so you say, okay, fine, don't use it. But it could be something like, you know, you have to fill up a timesheet every day. It is compulsory. Or you have to write two reports, let's say. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong again over here. But I'm giving one report and again I have to give a second report just because it's a compliance. Okay. Uh, here when you're talking of a negative reinforcer, okay, I'm looking at removing an, uh, a kind of penalty or a punishment. For example, late coming to lay other than the driver. Okay, late uh, other than the salary cut. Hota hai. Yeah, um, what you call as uh, uh, late coming to lay, you may have to, uh, you may have to, uh, uh, you know, a full day's leave is going to be cut. Okay, that could be a punishment which can seem like a an unpleasant thing which you may remove. Uh, I take your example of holding onto a rail over a period of time; it becomes, uh, you know, very boring or it becomes uh, like a punishment. But still, I would think of not removing a safety standard. This is my thought. However, I mean, I could be wrong also. Uh -huh. 
Uh, the person is coming late just uh, just giving an example from your example itself so uh, when the com a person comes late and even yes. after that he is doing his work on time then yes. uh, the waiver can be given that uh, once he is late we cannot consider it as a leave because uh, um, you know he has been doing the work on time so can we think that that is a removal yes. of punishment yes yes definitely definitely you get a waiver for example a lot of people uh, who travel to uh, you know different cities for work for such people if you to meet your targets then there are no time zones for them they can come in whenever they want to and they can go whenever they want to so, yes and uh, uh, one more example ma'am if if a person is very capable of doing work from home also like uh, uh, like you know um, mothers were, for example who, are, who need to take care of their kids for them also a work from home um, might also be given as an uh, you know an opportunity if they are even coming late and doing work on time can that yeah. be also considered yes of course or uh, in that in such a case uh, you know you could also consider it as a reward now right when you are saying yeah, that you yeah. do not uh, yes. if you are thinking it as a negative reinforcer you can look at it as a at it as a positive reinforcer where you say that okay, okay you do a good job and uh, you're getting the reward of working from home this yes my okay my okay All thank right? you ma'am welcome uh, ma'am uh, one yeah yeah, yeah. thank you for uh, so uh, ma'am just wanted to understand one thing for example the performance improvement plan basically like in in most of the organizations we link that uh, performance link pay throughout the appraisal system so we have already created a merit system where we are actually trying to give certain benefits to the employees like where if they are performing good parallelly or simultaneously we are actually putting certain clauses and terms and conditions so if in case the person is unable to perform the task or meeting the desired goal then we are putting them into the pip phase for couple of months removing those benefits so they are not going to receive the performance link plan apart from mm -hmm. that they would be restricted to get any sort of a promotion also in the upcoming mm -hmm. cycles mm -hmm. so if okay. in case they perform good and after that when they were like coming out of that particular phase of pip then again mm -hmm. those people should get the benefits or they are getting the benefits in the next cycle so can okay. we consider all this kind of a thing with both the kind of a conditioning like what we have been talking about yeah can i say that you are adding a punishment it comes in the third segment which is the okay. uh, positive punishment okay so you're saying that in addition to putting you on a pip we are taking away your benefits so it's a you know uh, it is a, a positive punishment right that that's the way i would look at it correct so, uh, correct okay uh, so now we go on to the third one where we are talking thank you thank you mr jugal teacher what you are talking about over here is actually a positive punisher we are saying you are, you you are adding a penalty for something to elicit a particular type of behavior and you are actually enhancing that by adding another punishment the punishment uh, as such uh, is a harsh word to use but that's the way skinner looks at it right you are saying that look uh, you don't do this as it is you are not getting your promotion but your benefits are also being uh, kind of uh, uh, sorry sorry that comes actually under uh, the what you are talking about a negative punishment you are saying that your performance incentive also has been taken up i i stand corrected right we are saying that look there is a penalty but we are also taking away your uh, you are not getting a promotion but you are also not getting your benefits right that becomes a punishment harsh word to use but uh, 
Uh, am I making sense to you, Mr. Jugal Kishore? Was that Mr. Jugal Kishore who, who spoke just now? Am I there? All right, we continue with this. We're looking at uh, positive punishers and we're also looking at negative punishers. Okay, so what you're saying in a positive punisher, and I'll, I'll deliberately read out this example when I say, in addition to cutting, and it's like for example, someone's coming late, you're cutting somebody's leave and you're also telling that you will not get your this week's incentive. You won't get an incentive this week. Now, the fourth one where, where I'm looking at negative punishers, where I'm saying that a particular reward is being taken away from you also. I'm saying that your regular, uh, what you're talking about, your regular leave is being cut. But suppose I had said that at the end of this project, you would have got this particular reward. You would have got a vehicle or you would have got something, whatever. That is being withdrawn right now. We are not going to some a line of sight criteria which the person was looking forward to. That is being withdrawn. All right. So these are our examples of operant conditioning where you're adding a reward. All right. Number two, you're taking away something unpleasant. Number three, you're, you, you are calling it a penalty or a punishment. I would rather call it a penalty instead of as a punishment. Punishment typically means that you're making somebody stand up on the desk, right? Uh, you're actually, uh, you know, uh, adding, uh, sorry, you're adding a punishment or you're uh, taking away a reward. All right. These are our operand conditionings. Now, uh, friends, let's now go on to the next type of, uh, uh, you know, there is another type of reinforcement over here or what you call as operand conditioning, which is called as extinction. Okay. Extinction. For example, in due course of time, in due course of time, Certain rewards become extinct over a period of time. Can you see this? Can you see this? When, you know, a certain type of behavior becomes part of, uh, becomes part of regular behavior of a person's, uh, uh, of a person's learning cycle. So you know that, uh, you know, over a period of time, somebody is going, for example, you you uh, start a training on let's say Excel. I I was talking to somebody from a real estate uh, construction company the other day, and he said that uh, today we don't reward our people for knowing Excel or for learning Excel. Are you getting this? Uh, why? Why? If I say that if I, if I have a training program on Excel and I motivate people to join the, that uh, uh, Excel program uh, and uh, by giving them a reward, right? He says that today we do not reward our people anymore for joining an Excel program and for getting uh, certified in it or for becoming an expert in this. Why would I say that, friends? Uh, because in the current era, like when all of uh, us are becoming tech savvy, it is like uh, default expected from someone who is coming to the organization that you know how to operate a computer, how to work with Microsoft Suite or Google Suite. So mm. it is an expected thing that comes. So that's why mm. uh, we do not reward uh, the person for going for a Excel program. Excellent. Excellent. So he said that it is a hygiene factor. It is something that a person has to know because it is your part of your key competency and skill at work. It's it's like having a qualification. So if you don't have that qualification, all right, then you jolly well learn this at work. And for that, there is no reward. It's, it's part of 
the hygiene training and it's got to be done. So nobody is going to motivate you or nod you for it, except that if you don't have it, maybe your job will not remain over a period of time. And that's where you say over a period of time, some rewards become extinct. That means there are no reinforcements for that. Learning is a necessity over there. The rewards become extinct. This is something that I added, although it's not there in our notes, or, or although, uh, you know, our uh, syllabus talks only about the four types of reinforcements. All right. Something interesting where you said that over a period of time, some rewards or some incentives for learning become extinct. They're just not given. You have to learn. You have to learn. Can you tell me what are some of the things in your work profile where uh, you you have to know this? Or you have, and if you don't know, you better learn. Is there something? Would someone like to give me an example? Come on. Come like on. Business emails. Oh. Okay. Yes. And how to you communicate on a uh, mail? Oh no! Can you repeat? Communications and reply when you reply on a mail. Uh, hmm. there's a certain language to be followed. Yeah. Hmm. Because yes, uh, yes, a formal hmm. language. Uh, better. Hmm. Uh, you know, a communicative language where, as in, hmm. you're the leader of that particular uh you know, department or or the you know taking an ownership of. So you need to follow a certain language while communicating. True. Yes. True. It's something that uh, you cannot do without. So every time I can't keep giving you a reward for writing a good email or how to yeah. communicate. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Ma'am, as soon as as soon as a person joins a company, uh, like he would be given a training, mm. which is actually yes. needed for the project. So even that can be then can be considered. Definitely. 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 When you're talking about you're saying this is induction. These are the hygiene yeah. factors which, uh, you know, there's a base no level at which uh, the initially maybe a, for motivation they give you much. They said, fine, see, care, let me go, let me do whatever. Uh, in due course of time, we are looking at, yeah. uh, you know, completely, uh, you know, uh, not withdrawal of the reward, but in due course of time, it gets taken for granted that there are no rewards for learning. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for that. Um, Thank you. I just wanted to ask you whether you would like to take a guess at these or shall we move? You can take this down. If you want, you can take a screenshot and um, maybe at the end of our session, we can see whether these are positive reinforcers, negative reinforcers, whether they are uh, positive punishments or negative punishments. We can do that later. Right now, let's get on with our syllabus. I'll come back to this slide again i promise you all right uh yeah now uh i don't know whether i discussed this in the last class if i have please let me know i don't want to waste your time have we or have we not when we are talking about bandulas learning by observing when you watch other people's behavior i think we did, did this the last time Quickly, yes. I'll quickly summarize Yes, ma'am, we did this. The learners watch by observing. You look at someone and you see how they behave and the four processes here are attention, retention, and we are talking about motor reproduction. You know, it's like I pay attention, I retain, I retain that in my memory and then I try to reproduce that by, if it's a, if it's a skill, it would require my limb movement like it's for example when you learn dance by watching somebody and how motivated you are. Ultimately, if I'm not motivated, I will not repeat somebody's behavior because I feel that there is some merit in that. Only then would I repeat that. So right. So that's what you're talking about. Again, I'm not looking at uh, uh, this. Uh, we now move on to what you call as cognitivism. Cognitivism. If you remember, in the first section, in our very first class, we looked at the meaning of cognitive. Can someone refresh my memory? 
can somebody refresh my memory when I say cognitive? Cognitive. What does the word have to do with? Over to you, friends. And there's a reason why I'm asking all of you to talk. Ma'am, it is uh, seeing, hearing. Uh, seeing, hearing. Seeing. Uh, it seeing. relates to knowledge. Ma'am, it's about knowledge. It's about through, uh, involving all the senses. senses. Uh, thinking. Yeah. Yes. Analyzing, analyzing the information. It's a mental process. It's, it's a mental, a mental process. process. It's yes. a mental process. Where we say when you're talking of cognitive, anything to do with the brain. And uh, when you say, you know, uh, you look at these words when you're talking about recognize or you take cognition of something, okay? What are we doing? What are we doing? We're actually referring to that beautiful term, gray cells that we're talking about. Use your gray cells this way. So you're actually, there's some activity having, uh, happening inside the brain where Something is being embedded on your brain. Now, typically, all of us, uh, you and I, all of us learn because we want our brain to be active and we all uh, want to be brainy, right? So the term for that. So when you're talking of cognitive learning, we're actually looking at how we can ignite our mental processes, or you call as uh, neurology, neurological sciences, to do something or to learn something. Now, I would also like, I, I, even at the cost of repetition, uh, you've heard of something called growth mindset, fixed mindset. Today, more than anything else, the world is talking about something called neuroplasticity. Have you heard of this term earlier? There's a lot being spoken about neuroplasticity. Yes, Anyone? Ma yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma we have heard about it. We have heard about it. Right, right now, there's a lot of research going on on neuroplasticity. What is it? What is it? What are we talking about over here? When I say neuroplasticity? Come on, let's take a chance. It's, ma'am, it's, uh, huh? it's about... Uh, it's about uh, that... Uh, Eventually, it's a muscle memory. Uh, the brain is a muscle memory, and any and everything that we want to learn, uh, let's hmm. say, kind of we can achieve memory. it. Uh, we can achieve it by practicing it, and eventually, it becomes hmm. a part of a uh, second uh, nature. Yes, second nature. Rightly said. Oh, yeah, uh, I think yeah. it is uh, the ability to change and adapt uh, overall. I mean, over over the time period, over the environment, throughout the life, whatever we are seeing and watching and learning. So changing and adapting that timely is something uh, what neuroplasticity is. Okay, okay. So all of you are correct. And I'm so happy that, uh, you know, we we uh, we know that whatever we do, so the, the primary uh, philosophy over here or the, or the theory or the science behind it is that the brain is also uh, an organ. And if you don't use it, then it's going to atrophy over a period of time. All of us know that uh, sometimes over a period of time, we, we forget some things. Correct? We forget uh, some things because we've never thought of them or it's never been part of uh, our regular. Life. Today, if you ask me to do math, I just can't do it. Right? I can do basics. Tables, I can learn. Why? Because tables are part of my, uh, it is something that has been ingrained in us, right? And our teachers made us practice that over a period of time. But if you ask me to do algebra or trigonometry, I can't do it because I'm not practiced that over a long period of time. Which means that somewhere my brain has stored it in some corner and it's, uh, you know, I'll have to do a lot of practice now to recall that as well and do it. So we're talking of, uh, when you get new information, when you're getting new information, the brain is processing it. So you're calling it a neurological process. And if I get new information, I have to attach it to something that is uh, you know, already there in my brain. Uh, and this attachment is called as schema. schema. This is what in cognitivism we are looking at. So there is certain information that is stored in my brain 
in a particular scheme or in a particular pa uh, pattern, prior knowledge, whichever way my brain has stored this, when new knowledge comes in, I will take that, I will process that or I will, it gets attached and then the new information and the old information together make connections and that's how knowledge is learned or knowledge is picked up and it becomes permanent. Anyone wants to give an example of this? When I learn something and I attach it to what I have. No, Learning okay. music. Wonderful. Okay. How would you do that? How would so, you do that? Huh. So first we would, uh, like when we uh, go to classes, we completely uh, try to learn new things daily. And once uh, uh, we get, we need to practice it uh, all time. So mm -hmm. that if we don't practice as, as such, as you told, that would uh, again become a trophy so that uh, we don't, then later, if someone asks us something, we would not be able to uh, do it. Okay. So, so talking about music. learning a new piece of music, you're saying that you would attach it to what you have already in your mind. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. And what you know yes, about music already. How much, how well. And these connections together can, can put uh, processes together. I'll give you an example over here. I think somebody else wanted to talk. Over to you. And then I'll give you my example. Yeah. So one example, which I think would be a very simple ride, riding a motorbike. So in mm. childhood, we learn how to ride a bicycle. Now mm. that experience of balancing into the two wheels, handling the uh, uh, handle, braking and everything, mm. the same knowledge, it's a prior knowledge. And when we are learning, a, riding a motorbike, the new knowledge is how do you handle the gears? How do you accelerate and all? So prior yeah. knowledge would be how do you manage the two wheels and the new knowledge would be how do you manage the gears and accelerator. So this makes us how do we ride a bike. So I think that can be an example. Wonderful. So your brain has already stored the the technique of or the knowledge of what happens. I mean, the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bike cycle and then you're attaching it to, you're connecting it with the riding a motorcycle. Right? Yeah. Uh Thank you. Yeah. Ma'am, I have one more one more point I have here. Yeah. Please, Mr. Gopal. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, in this case, can we consider simulation uh, type of learning? For example, if we are going to learn how to uh, drive a four-wheeler vehicle, so first mm. they put us on simulators and then they uh, give us a car in our, hand, in our hand and we can use that simulator experience a feel uh, while driving that car. Actually, Definitely. Definitely, definitely. You can, uh, yeah, I mean, you know already and you're using it and simulator actually, you're not doing the actual thing. You're making brain connections here and trying to use that. Definitely. You are removing out of memory is what you're saying. Correct? So, um, yeah, ma'am, mostly in training, <clears throat> mostly in training when we ask our participants to do pre-read that come prepared or read this and then come for training. That is something which we are actually asking them to have some basic information, then I can build upon it. So that could also be this kind of an approach that you do some pre read Yes. You attach it to it. Mr. Sudarshan Sharma has raised his hand. Over to you, sir. Uh, good morning. Morning. Uh, so I was just checking key, uh, whether the uh, motor skills can be considered in this uh, cognitive learning theory. So long as your brain is processing. Mm -hmm. So long as your brain is processing something and it is churning existing knowledge, connecting it, making an association, any knowledge or competency can be <laughs> Cognitivism, cognitivism. Okay. So they well, can be considered here as well. Can be considered. They can be considered. Uh, All right. Yeah, people were giving the example of biking, uh, riding bikes, and yeah, driving, riding cars. Bikes. So that right. comes under the same. It definitely comes under the same. Uh, so here you are trying to, uh, you know, uh, you you may be wanting to distinguish between behaviorism and cognitivism. Correct? Okay. So when you're talking of cognitivism, it mm -hmm. is about making knowledge permanent in your mind. You're making knowledge permanent in your mind. So, yeah, 
दिमाग में बस गया एंड आई हैव स्टोर्ड दिस इंफॉर्मेशन इट इज नाउ अ पार्ट ऑफ माई ब्रेन सिस्टम कॉग्नेटिव सिस्टम आई हैव नॉलेज अबाउट दिस सो इट्स अबाउट रिमेम्बरिंग समथिंग इज वॉट वी आर टॉकिंग इंफॉर्मेशन प्रोसेस इन mental processes involved in cognitive learning right uh, i'm taking you to what you call as the psychology of cognitivism cognitive psychology of field in itself look at some of these things and then uh, i'm not going to elaborate on them because then you know but uh, typically human intelligence right depends on how quickly you are able to absorb things depends on people's perception what you think of things depends on attention now attention also is a process attention involves uh, you know focusing on something and your ability to focus so, so many people have what you call as attention deficit or, or, or disorder when you're talking of attention what is a person's capacity to pay attention to something what is a person's capacity to think and solve problems and how good is somebody's memory how good so all of these can be practiced language can be practiced and learned thinking and problem so all of these can be um can i say made robust by uh, by uh, stimulating the brain or by uh, uh, by stimulating the brain so if i don't think at all then my brain becomes uh, static uh, if i don't try to that is why they say you know that uh, uh, as you grow older you need to do sudoku you need to solve crosswords you need to play, play memory games why because that way your memory uh, you know is enhanced and your brain remains active so here we are talking about activating the brain to to learn right and uh, look at some of these uh, mental processes involved in cognitive can you see the slide my dear friends one perception uh, what do you mean by perceive uh, uh, perceiving something anyone ma'am how do we see something mm -hmm. uh uh or rather how we interpret what we are seeing uh okay. could be influenced by uh, our past experiences mm -hmm. okay and and uh, how we had processed that experience okay okay uh yes very true now mm -hmm. let's do a small exercise yeah mr abhijit uh, has raised his hand hi ma'am ma'am uh, this yeah. is also uh, in the in the lines of what is uh, uh like what you said in the previous slide is like unconscious competencies right so where in uh wonderful the, the, wonderful. Okay. the four levels of competencies which are there right yes conscious yeah, competence uh unconscious competence can you can you tell me the four can we what we are actually doing is a memory game yes ma'am yeah so uh, these are the four so, yeah yeah ma'am so there are basically four levels which is there uh, where in uh, in the first level is uh, unconscious incompetence because where i am not at all uh, aware of anything and i don't have the skill set uh, mm -hmm. the second is basically uh, the level where you know that you are supposed to do this but you are not competent enough to do mm -hmm. this 
uh the third level is conscious competence you are aware of what you are supposed to do but you do not have the enough competencies to do that and the fourth one is mm-hmm. unconscious competency where you become becomes a natural process for you for like what uh, one of my friends said about driving a car nowadays mm-hmm. driving a car becomes a very i mean for people who know how to drive a car it becomes a very common thing they know that mm-hmm. you get into the car you have to put it in from neutral to first and then you drive and then the speed increases you put it to the second gear so these are the four levels of uh, competencies very true excellent thank you so much for that thank you so much for that uh, thank you ma'am we are looking at you know embedding this knowledge into your system in your brain system all right now uh, thank you for that example i would like to uh, dwell on each of these as much i mean if we if then if each of these mental processes just for half a minute or for 15 seconds this is small exercise uh and those of us i mean all of us are adults right all of us are or we not we are about 21 or 22 can you think of recall something where uh, your perception about something uh, was different when you were a teenager and uh, it has changed today or your opinion or your uh, your value about something your reason changed when uh, you were uh, maybe in school and it changed later over to you rajesh very 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 simple one uh, ma'am once yes. we were in school we used to think that life after job will be so easy but mm-hmm. now because the money would come okay when we are a Sorry. working professional we understand the problems of a working professional now Okay, so that has changed now. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I would like to. Uh, I would like to say that initially we used to think that theory is more important for, uh, say, when school or in college, getting degrees is important. But mm-hmm. I think when we started working, I realized that experience, application mm-hmm. of that mm-hmm. knowledge, is mm-hmm. more important. Uh, you might a twelfth standard might have much richer experience than somebody who would have passed from a very uh, would have lot of degrees because he had applied that knowledge. So I think even street smartness has proved more than you know getting a uh, lot of degrees from very reputed colleges. I have experienced this, and this has changed my perception. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for such beautiful examples, all of you. Can I say here? that the lens through which we have we see things now uh has changed uh i mean our lenses keep changing right and the color of our lenses keep changing yes or no anyone i'm talking of notional lenses i'm not talking yes, about ma'am. real time contact lenses it does yeah so uh, you know uh, it's also about uh, learning how to change your lenses over a period of time If you keep on, uh, you know, wearing the same lens lifelong, I guess learning might never happen, or the mental process will never change. So that's why we are talking of perception. Recognition is actually when you see something and when you attach it or connect it with what you already know. You say, okay, fine, this is what, uh, and you may you see something, you recognize, you have a image of a person's face stored in your mind. and when you see that person or when you see that you can radhika you raised your hand you want to say something uh ma'am i wanted to give an example of perception so i think when we were teenagers uh, our parents used to keep telling us that you know be in a good company uh, stay around people who are uh, you know good people around you and now when we grow up uh, we see the youngsters around and we feel oh yes our parents were right their concern was right uh so i think that perception has changed when we were young we used to feel our parents always keep us keep uh, you know uh, giving us lectures or something and now when we have grown up when now when we see youngsters we feel that concern for them that hope they are in good uh, uh, surroundings absolutely absolutely so your perception has changed now because there is more information in your brain in our and in the, the brain right now which can process the reasons for which this advice was given to us right yeah Very thank you for the perception is changed now i'll quickly go to uh, 
remembering we also spoke about this but uh, can we look at what you call as imagining okay like i said human beings are the only uh, are the only uh, animals or living beings who can imagine and create stories in their own mind thinking i'm not going to be talking about uh, we already know that but let's do for two minutes look at what you mean by judging and reasoning so we are actually uh, why do we judge and what is judging why do human beings tend to judge uh, ma'am i understand uh, the past experiences personal experiences or a per an experience which somebody else has shared with us in a uh, mm -hmm. is quite a foundation for us to judge uh, always being careful and uh, mm -hmm. you know avoiding a loss while taking a risk i think you mm -hmm. know you tend to since we are not uh, we always be very careful with mm -hmm. the actions of others or a situation so i think okay. that's one reason why uh, judging comes into place i feel okay. uh, yeah. yes ma'am yeah very true very true thank you for that very true now uh, there is also something i mean i think all of your uh, all of you have also been attending your ob classes simultaneously uh, along with uh, the subject there is something called values uh, you know where all of us have some concepts of i will do something and i will not do something or this is right and this is wrong so there is also that uh, element of ethics values right wrong which has been in brain and which is somewhere stored in the brain so when you are talking of a cognitive process we also judge human beings tend to decide or put them in labels of right wrong ethics yes no well or not well or good bad these are all things that go under the domain of judging and reasoning it out also when you are talking about reasoning you are actually trying to analyze you are trying to rationalize we are saying that you are trying to find meaning out of the whole thing problem solving conceptualizing i think all of us are quite aware of that and we look at these as training concepts a little later on so that's where we say that cognitivism is actually a mental process and it's about using the brain for storing knowledge or making knowledge like my friend very beautifully said it's about an unconscious competence over a period of time it becomes set in your mind and then you don't need to think again and about it becomes natural to your system so thanks for those examples now look at what are the training methods now this is important for all of us what are some of the ways in which you can use cognitive learning okay for training the training methods so let's look at role play uh brainstorming memory games solving a real company problem uh does anyone want to for the next 5 minutes just to break the monotony of a lecture uh, would anyone want to, would you want to do this i'll i'll keep quiet and we can play one of these which one would you like to do which one would you like to do would you like to do a role play or would you like to play a memory game memory or would game. you like memory yes, yes so over to you yes ma'am okay uh let's do this quickly let's do this quickly are all of you sitting in a particular place are all of you sitting in a particular place yes ma'am yes, yes ma'am yes, ma okay yes ma'am yes, ma i'm giving you i'm giving you uh two minutes two minutes uh assuming that all of you are at home assuming that uh, all of you are, are at home quickly go around your house quickly go around your home and identify identify uh at least seven items seven items uh in your house which you had taken for granted and not looked at something that uh, something that 
you suddenly felt, oh my God, this is also there actually. And come back to your seat. On your mark, get set, go. Your time starts now. Are we back? Yes, yes ma'am, we are. Yes, ma'am. Are we back? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Who starts now? Yes, ma'am, done. I can start. Yes, may I know who this is? Yeah, Yes. Yeah. Fire. So, yes. Okay. yes. So, I have a dog. So, we have a lot of play items for him. So, there are a lot of play items which we do not even see right now. So, those play items. Uh, then a skin product, which we have, uh, which we buy after watching after some advertisements. So we keep them, but we do not use them. So it is there in the cupboard. So a specific kind of pen or pencil, which we see in some fair or something, and we just buy it out of uh, excitement. And it is still there. Uh, Keychains. So I keep collecting keychains, but I look at them after a year or maybe a few months or uh, maybe after years, I see them. So this that is also there. And uh, my guitar, which I have, which I actually have kept it for a long time. So I think after years, I just look at it and then I realize, oh, okay, I have that one as well. So, yeah. So when will you start playing the guitar now again? <laughs> I will start it soon, ma'am. It will start it soon, right? Okay. Thank you. And wonderful. Wonderful. Now, uh, yes, I'll come back to you, uh, Ms. Payal. There's someone else. Come on, quickly, quickly, quickly. Okay, ma'am, uh, this is my Yuri and what I saw in uh, my place is that uh, I made a fountain when I was uh, around, when I was in my intermediate or so. So uh, it was in a corner, I saw that. And there were a few awards which I received. And, uh, you know, uh, when I saw it right now after a very long time. There's a very big suitcase which was given by my parents during my wedding. So that was also there. And there's a God idol in my Almara, which uh, uh, I didn't see since ages. And uh, again, a weighing machine, uh, which I always keep on thinking to reduce weight. And, uh, you know, this is what I saw today after so okay. long time. After so long. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. I want to go ask what the Dr. Mayuri to ask you. Now, what yeah. insight the, did this give you? I mean, how did you make, how did it make you feel? And what ideas, is it, I mean, what future action are you going to take with you? Um, I felt that I have uh, too many competences which I am not even looking for. I need to practice my, uh, you know, what all. I have been receiving award for my singing, for my, uh, you know, being a very good trainer. So I think I was uh, missing all that these days because uh, getting busy. So I wanted to do something bad, the big so that I would again receive awards for uh, these things. And uh, I want to uh, really look for, you know, doing something new. Okay. Okay. Maybe you'll sit down tonight and think of another 10 things, okay, yes. which uh, yeah. you try to recollect which are there at home, which you haven't, uh, you know, actually got down to using or picking up, all right? Yes, yes. Uh, I'll tell you why I asked you this. So just give me a hang on a minute. I'll come back. Ms. Anamitra. Quick, yes, ma'am. Oh. Yes, yeah. Books yes, that I have never, books that I plan to read in the future, okay. clothes that I haven't worn worn okay. in a long time okay. uh, electronic gadgets that I haven't used alright very good so many things which are there now uh, can I say something over here so see, yes ma'am please can you, can, you, can you actually now for example use all of these books that you haven't used clothes that you haven't electronic gadgets all of these can be used for you to come out of uh, like I said uh, a stalemate or a rut, 
which uh, you know and to refresh yourself or to rejuvenate yourself right? now can you do that can you do that you know yes ma'am you I, I can exercise? you can now you know why i why why we did we do this exercise i used this exercise uh during covid or when we were doing our, our online classes to develop team building skills among the students and how did did we do this we said let all the students go around their own houses typically like they would do an outbound exercise if they had to be in a proper training room and collectively put together imaginatively all the items that they had within their own uh, resources to do uh, to make a collage or to make a model through which they may all go ahead either learn team building either learn interpersonal skills or simply an exercise in creativity mm -hmm. in creativity now this is something that uh, you know you can do one you can draw on people's memories or you can draw on what people already have and have forgotten about to refresh people and to rejuvenate and to do look at self transformation or personal rejuvenation all i'm looking at over here is change match all right upma sharma you raise your hands ma yeah i just wanted to add though i have collected like seven items and okay. uh, but uh, okay. there is a reflection also that i'm seeing in the items that i've got which i wanted huh. to ask and share that uh, mm. i see that most of these are related to health and mm. that is the area which i have been thinking that i'm not working on like i got uh, fitness you know this band it's like four years that i'm not using this watch just that i have to download an app and i'm i'm just ignoring it then i got the skipping rope right it's there in front of me but i've never been you know using it then something related to mental peace that there is a ipod there's a spiritual small small books but i'm not making up time to you know do and then this is for my strengthening for my arms and i mean for the hands fingers and such a easy thing approachable next sitting i mean there on the table next to me but not being used so i saw that you know all of these things are something related to mental peace and health so is it that your brain will attract the items that are uh, you know that you need yes of course maybe uh, it's a it's an unconscious uh, subconscious thing where people are actually we are doing, can you hear me there's some noise at the back so i hope that's not yes, disturbing yes, all of you can yeah. hear you so it is and uh, i think we're slowly moving into the constructivist uh, learning theory we are saying that you're picking up consciously what you want to you're associating mm -hmm. right And uh, once you've looked at the, the at a fitness gadget, automatically your brain is moving towards, or your mind is moving towards looking at additional uh, uh, health gadgets. Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're saying? Your brain tends to yeah. move in a particular pattern and reinforcing the health thing in your mind because True. somewhere the health thing there in your mind yeah it's just like a surprise for me that this also happens that unconsciously i am picking up those things which i maybe wanted to you know do mm -hmm. or yeah of course of course that's your uh, that's your underlying positive uh, now we are going into philosophy and spiritualism over here one would want I mean, uh, but uh, you are actually drawing yourself or propelling yourself to look for those things right beautiful beautiful so what is the message that you are getting out of all of this and what is it that one would want to derive from this this is something that you can use in a training session you can use it wherever you want to whether it's in a wellness program or in a in a positive thinking program or simply in a skill building program or in a problem solving program uh, uh, you know program wherever you can use this or you can also look at a strategic development session for your organization long and short friends these are some examples i hope all of you are familiar with lateral thinking or with the and with the desert survival game yes no i think no. all of us have done that no 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 
actually uh, you will get the results survival game uh, even on the internet but it was developed by an army colonel who you know, it's a fictitious situation you can put your entire uh, training group uh, uh, into a desert and say that these are the 10 items that you're left with because your plane has crashed. And if you have to move towards safety or towards the habitation, how will you use these 10 items to reach your destination? It's a beautiful game. And more than anything else, it, um, it helps the participants to uh, exercise the brain and uh, think of new, uh, new uses for existing items. Just like what you did now, but it's a little beyond. Them. Think of new ways of using existing items and also to negotiate with your team members to, uh, you know, to decide the right strategy for survival. Try this out. But I have a question here. I have never played this lateral game before, but it sounds very interesting. So what I would like to know is, is there an end result that the trainer will have in mind? Or is it how the participants want to carry it forward? The trainer will be okay with that. Uh, what is the outcome? Okay. Now, when you're saying the trainer never has the right answer for anything, what is the facilitator? Trainer is a facilitator. When you're talking of lateral thinking, as a manager, at any point of time, I need to have the ability to think in different ways. I cannot have a fixed way of looking at things. I cannot have a fixed perception of things. Then is seven hats, seven hats, seven thinking hats, six thinking hats. Six, 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 six thinking hats oh, yeah, is one lateral thinking exercise. There are different ways in which you can do it. Can I look at different solutions for a particular problem? And can I get the group to arrive at a consensus on how can we take the best out of five different solutions and arrive at one solution? So trainer will never, and ideally, trainer should never have a final say on anything. Trainer should be a person who enables people to think in different ways and then, then say, let's make a synthesis of things. Okay, so that will be the debrief. Uh, in that case, the debrief will be on the consensus that all the participants will arrive at. Yes, yes. Now, even if you're looking at a desert survival game, there is a solution. There is a ranking based on an army officer's, uh, you know, experience. So the trainer will show these solutions and say, this is the way you could have thought. But then it's one way, now the participants will feel, oh my God, I did not think of this, so I'm a failed person or I'm a failure. Not at all. I have learned. So the training has gone from point A to point B or maybe C or D, and the training has learned something. So when you're looking at all of these, what are we looking at? Has the training made an attempt? Has the training exercised his brain to think of different ways and to think in different ways? Am I right? Right. Absolutely. Here? Thank you so yes. much. But okay. Uh, what is the why, why are we doing all these exercises? Are we doing it for the trainer or are we doing it for the participants to learn something and to grow from point A to point B? Develop. All right. Yeah. Maybe so, Ms. Rita, uh, so, Ms. Yes, Rita, do you think yes. reverse thinking and brainstorming will be part of this lateral thinking exercise? Absolutely. Okay. I may say that, see, you know, I can say reverse thinking. I, I, I Rather ar arriving at a solution, I mean, you just see the extreme of what what it can happen, right? In the reverse thinking. And then you brainstorm. Okay. Then you win. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Now, for example, you can combine all of these methods. You can say, I, I solve a real life uh, company problem through brainstorming. Let everybody talk. Right? And then that everybody and then you make a collage or a synthesis or like I said, take a real life company problem and you put them into a lateral thinking exercise. Let each one, let somebody look at the negative side, let somebody look at the positive side and let's make it, you know, into a combined game. 
right? So you can use that and you can actually take all of this to do a role play also, uh, a discussion, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, an interaction or a TPT between two teams. That can also happen. So there are various ways. It all depends on the trainers. Like so somebody asked me over here, trainers' creativity or the trainers' ability to uh, to motivate people to participate in the activities, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Can we so move to the done. next slide? Yeah. Yes. So then yes, we were looking at when I. Dr. Rita, you're on mute, uh, or is it only for me? Okay. All this while was I on mute? No, no, no. just. Uh, while okay, changing the slide. While changing the slide. All right. Uh, the third one that we're talking about here is what is called as the constructive learning theory. So you'll uh, be surprised over here. What do I mean by constructivism? What do I mean by constructivism? So, for example, I'm telling you something when, when we spoke about a particular idea. Um, how many of us have been just taking it and storing it in our brain? And how many of us have been trying to make constructs of that in your own mind? Uh, have any of us attended a training on, let's say, dress code or, uh, let's say, cross-cultural etiquette? Have you heard of something called a yes, cross Yes, yes, ma'am. Right? Okay. Ma'am, uh, yes, soft ma skills yeah. would also be a part of uh, a training on soft skills. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. All right. Yes, uh, let's say uh, you have a training on. Uh, can I go to dining etiquette just for uh, you know uh, as an example for training? Sure. Yeah, yes. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Now, typically. Uh, uh, you let's say you have a you have a course on dining etiquette, how to uh, you know use the fork plate or whatever it is. Now, if you attend a training on uh, use of uh, certain equip, uh, what, do I call it equipment? What do I call it? Fork, knife, spoon, or all those your dining items. Yes. Uh, cut, cut, cutlery. Cutlery. Thank you. Thank you. Cutlery. Now. Uh, when I'm using that, and I'm learning how to use a fork, a knife, or a, uh, or a, a spoon, or let's say even if I'm learning how to use chopsticks, right? When I'm learning that, I already have some constructs in my mind about how to use it. I would have watched a movie where I've seen someone using that. How many of us have seen the movie, uh, My uh, Pretty Woman? Julia Roberts? Yes, ma'am. I have. Yeah. That is one of them. All of us. All of us. All of us. Yes, all of us have that, right? Okay. You have that so oyster have... flying into the waiter. Ah, wonderful. Wonderful. Thank and you. I think my uh, ma'am Princess Diary also has that etiquette. Uh, Princess okay. Diary too has it the same. There yeah. is an etiquette training over there. Yes. Right? yes. So somewhere while watching that, I look, I mean, how beautifully all the examples came out. And when I say now, if I start uh, talking about dining etiquette and I take your mind to uh, take your memory back or take what you've seen in Pretty Woman or in uh, The Princess Diary or whatever other, uh, uh, yes, I would like to take you back to Roman Holiday, Audrey Hepburn, where mm -hmm. uh, you know she, she just hates all the etiquette and she, she just moves out of that. But uh, it's also well ingrained into her. Uh, whenever we are about to learn something new, whenever we, uh, whenever a person or a student or a learner is learning something aluta, new, aluta, the person or that learner, uh, you know, takes that information and connects it to something that the person already knows and makes his own construct makes your own concept. If I tell you, if I tell you that this is a way to train, you already know something about it, about training. That is why 
each one of you is here. Am I right? Yes, ma'am. None of us are raw in training, right? All of us have some degree of experience. All of us have some degree of idea and a mentor and an image and uh, about how training should be done. So you will take information from me. You will take information or whatever from other trainers or other facilitators who are also going to be, be doing a lot of work. And you're going to synthesize all that, connecting it to what you already know. And you are going to make your own science or your own practices in training. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, ma'am. Yes. All of you would have already decided in your mind that uh, this is what she's told us, but I'm going to take so much information from her. I'm going to use more or less of what I already know about training or about learning methods, and I'm going to form my own training programs or training ideas. Yes or no? Yes or no? Ma'am. Yes. Because all of us are intelligent yes. human beings. All of us have experience of having done something. Right? That's the reason I'll tell you. Now, uh, my husband already knew how, and he was an expert rider when he, when he started learning how to drive a car. And therefore, learning how to drive, he stopped his classes. I think there's a, there are 15 sessions. He stopped. Uh, his driving lessons after the 10th session. And he said, he said, I know how to drive now. I will start. And he actually did that. Whereas someone like me had to go through all the 15 lessons in driving, take additional 20 lessons on my own car. And then I started driving. Actually, it took me a long time. Why? Because I was at zero. He was already at 0. 0.5 or, uh, you know, he was already at 7 or whatever, in the art of driving. So why I'm telling you this is because people form their own constructs based on what they already know and they decide how much to take and what to take and how to synthesize that. People don't take in passive knowledge. This is what Piaget just said. And that's why learners construct knowledge. They do not passively take in information. And when I say learners construct language and don't take information passively. Today, even a small child doesn't take information passively. If a mother says that this has to be learned, whatever, the daughter will learn a particular dish or learn cooking from her only if she feels that, okay, this is there is merit in this, that's one. And she will try to convert Indian cooking into something exotic and come out with something new because she's a modern girl. All right? People make their own representations of what they have learned. And then they will use it. And this again, you're talking about making schemas. Now, there's a lot in common between the cognitive, uh, between cognitivism and constructivism. It's just that two different people made this and therefore one called it cognitivism. Cognitivism again focuses more on the brain Whereas constructivism focuses more on building on or usage of how that reflects into the end product. Are we getting what we are saying? How it manifests into... So, Ma'am, in constructivism, we are trying to construct something on our own from the yes. information we are gathering from around us. Is that how it is? Yes, yes. You're gathering what you already have and, uh, you know, it's actually based on uh, the human ability in creativity, the human ability in, uh, like I say, architecture or art or the human ability to construct something, making something or, you know, building blocks. For example, you're getting a set of building blocks to have, have has anyone used uh, ma'am uh, can i ask for example, yes. an example uh, like uh, i learn a video editing then mm -hmm. uh, 
then i am editing videos Sorry? in my own own style that yes. called constructed learning wonderful wonderful you learn how to do okay. video editing you learn how to do photography okay how to use the uh, and then you decide whether you want to do nature and how you use nature how you synthesize that's constructive learning all of us do that on our cell phone right okay you yes, edit in your own the, the style time all in making reels and things yes sorry can you uh, can you can you repeat uh, because all our editors are currently making reels and things in instagram for <laughs> that's it <laughs> yes that's a constructive learning now for example now when you're talk, talking of constructive learning though it has a lot in common i would personally say that constructivism moves more towards getting the trainee to do things and it involves a lot of free leverage to the trainee to to make sense and to derive his own utility of what you have trained that person on and to do things according to the trainee's style of doing things and therefore you may have to be a mentor you may have to be a coach you may have to give, give some leeway and you also may have to act as a counselor once in a while when the trainee has a problem and the trainee comes to you you may also have to help the trainee to arrive at his own solutions when i say counselor a lot of us usually uh you know we usually tend to think that as a as a counselor i have to tell my counselee how to do things do this don't do this don't do that but counseling the science of counseling is actually when your counselee is stuck you need to allow that person through talking or through sitting down with you to find out where he or she is going wrong and arrive at his own solution instead of you telling that person so when i say it's a trainee centric approach to learning you can you need to be a mentor sometimes you need to be there you need to be able to help the person the personal domain as well in the uh, you know in the in the uh, official domain you need to be a coach sometimes you need to be a counselor you need to be a facilitator and in constructivist learning in constructivist learning you can use methods let's say such as you're talking about role play you get people to debate uh, how do debate different from a discussion friends or from brainstorming uh, because i think in debate uh, we will have uh... both positive and negative like pros and cons perspective so there will be a combination of uh, thought process however it will be very different from each other where we are actually not discussing but it is like i have this points which is completely opposite to your 10 points yes exactly in debate uh, yeah, it's like it's actually a uh, debate in debate we don't draw a solution they we need to find consensus somewhere where all the participants arrive at a particular decision but in debate we proactively encourage them to oppose each other and have their say how would that help miss neha since uh, how would a debate help i mean usually people say discussion is the best way but let's go uh, to the uh, uh, debate the um, there are participants like there are opponents and that is how we, it is in the real life also everyone will not be on your side every time so how do you convince someone that your point is the correct point by a little bit of aggression but more in the assertive way so maybe that is what we learn while we are debating excellent we're talking about you know uh, uh, you're talking about holding your own standpoint is that what you're talking about is yes ma'am absolutely yes yes do you think that holding your own stand here yes. thanks for that i could see a whole lot of other people also talking what do you think add, yeah, yeah. ma'am i yes. want to add in debate very rightly said what she just said, mentioned now uh, holding mm -hmm. a point and the best part is uh, the opponent the for and the against both are 
team members or friends. So mm. we also get to see that while you know imposing your point, how do you mm. even uh, see both? Uh, I feel both the parties are right on their own point. The mm. the thing which really gets highlighted how you still accept the point of the mm. other person, be assertive about your own point, and yet mm. uh, I think. Uh, there is a lot of teamwork also which we see during a debate. Yes, yes, this is very true. Yeah. Yes, um, uh -huh. during discussion, it is something like uh, we actually draw down few uh, solutions for the problem which has been there, and then yes. we discuss regarding the problem. And uh, I mean, we just come, we just draw the proper solution which is like more uh, perfect for the problem which has come. And in debates, we actually um, uh, make sure that whatever we are talking and whatever we are giving, like the two pros and cons, like uh, two uh, teams which are there, uh, what they do is like they would uh, come to a point, uh, tell a point that their solution is the perfect one. And the other team would even say that their solution is the correct one. So debate is something where we don't draw into a proper solution. But in discussion, we just get a uh, uh, proper and uh, you know, to be uh, aggregate or you know appropriate solution for the uh, for the problem and when problem solving is actually, more of a, yes actually yes, in debate there remains uh, two team one in favor and another uh, team remains in the uh, against so there are two teams and the final we the both the teams give their own thoughts and for, mm -hmm. after after sharing each other's thoughts they come to a consensus and that is called as a conclusion, the final okay. conclusion. So it is a discussion okay. and uh, mm -hmm. and share thought sharing of uh, of two teams and mm -hmm. uh, on a particular topic so that they can find a uh, final consensus. Wonderful. So you see the number of thoughts and uh, reflections that came on on a on the concept of debate itself. I can see that a lot more people who want to talk over here. Am I right? Yes? Yes? Okay. Now let me just take you to uh, this one, one thought over here. What skills or what abilities get developed when a student or when a learner is in a debate? What are we, what, what, what gets developed? So look at that when a person is debating. First thing is lateral thinking. They need to think laterally. Like okay. uh, about a topic from different points of view because they never know what will be the attack coming on the topic, on what point. And once that happens, they need to respond back. So they have to be very alert, thinking all the time, listening. Active listening is very important. Unless you listen to your opponent, what is the point they are making to cut your theory, you will not be yeah. able to answer back when it's your time, when your time comes. And of course, teamwork, maybe you do not have adequate knowledge or information on that particular topic. So while that has been discussed, you are listening, paying attention. At the same time, you're having a little bit of a discussion among yourselves as in how you will be uh, re re uh, responding to whatever is being said. So a lot of all our sensory organs are always involved in it and we are always on that too and it's a very exhilarating uh, feeling that happens after the debate is over wonderful wonderful thank you thank you so much for that and thank you ma thank you thank you all. thank you uh, miss neha and thank you all of you mr Shiv shivram has raised his hand we do have time for five more minutes so yes mr shivram Shivam, uh, I'm yes, sorry, not Shivam. Yeah. No worries, ma'am. Actually, uh, mm -hmm. what I have felt when we do debate is that we as mm -hmm. humans all have different beliefs and perspectives. So when we are mm -hmm. in a debate, we actually get to think from different perspectives as well. And we actually mm -hmm. get to question our own beliefs as well, like which might have not ever even questioned in the past before. So when someone mm -hmm. challenges us that, okay, uh, you this is my point. So at that time, we have two, uh, two thought processes. Maybe to accept that or maybe to retaliate that. Wonderful. Wonderful. So you're looking at matching thought processes, matching, uh, you know, what you already know, sometimes needing to change or maybe feel the need to change your own beliefs and constructs about something. So if you looked at all of these, we are focusing on the person or the learner who's doing all the activities. As a trainer, 
you are you know you are you are uh, can i say you are a bystander you are actually taking a back seat over here and putting the trainee in the center of the activity am i right am i right here you are putting yes ma'am absolutely yes ma'am yes, ma yeah. why i am saying this is because in our next session we would be looking at what is called the lecture method of teaching okay where uh, you know uh, the main philosophy is about the the facilitator doing all the activity we will definitely look at variations of that also but here when i say constructivist study theory uh, we are actually looking at how the trainee becomes the center point the learner becomes active and learns through that why because his brain is active his ideas and like somebody put it so beautifully over here his initial ideas and mental constructs about something are activated put to question synthesized with the opposite person's way of thinking and something new comes out of it. right am i am i correct i mean i may not have been able to, i may not be able to put it uh, synthesized the way you all have said it but that's what we are looking at that's the difference between constructivism and cognitivism i hope uh, all of us are uh, you know uh, are in sync with this now now let's look at what difference uh, how much time do we have i guess we do have another four or five minutes and let's uh, look at what different people the friends i just picked this up from a research paper uh, on constructive learning and how it can be used in teaching and training methods may sound a little theoretical but it's good to know and we can always benefit from more than what we have in our books i think this are from a research paper i'll share the name of the research paper also and when i share the when i share the powerpoint i'll probably send across that research paper also to all of you okay so looking at the, what uh, wilson spoke about constructive learning he says that a constructive learning environment is a place where learners may work together and support each other one of you said that right when you are in a debate you are also enabling the other person to talk and listen to him they use a variety of tools and information resources in guided pursuit of learning goals so very important what are your learning goals what is it that you want the person to learn and what are the problems that you are trying to solve like when i looked at when you said solving a real life problem in an organization in fact it works very beautifully you give them a set of newspapers and say take your uh, company's latest problem go around the organization and check out how you can solve certain problems okay and when you're talking of constructive learning it's very important uh, in terms of what kind of language does the facilitator or the trainer use in the learning setup here he says classroom i would call in a learning call it a learning setup okay we say what kind of language you know is used what communication system is used some of you just spoke about uh, i think you spoke about uh, making videos and reels so is there a proper communication system is there a conducive climate where people are allowed to talk okay what is the teacher's role what is the student's role if i come can can i as a teacher come as a learner also you know sometimes you should try this sit in the group discussion with the students and you also be part of the gd in a case study you sit you be a participant so what are the rule, roles are you putting the student in a teacher's role or are you putting the student in a uh, in a corporate role okay how well are you able to manage the classroom are you letting everybody talk are only a few people talking this is also something sometimes you know uh, students tend to one or two students tend to hog all the limelight and they do all the talking are you as a facilitator encouraging those who don't talk so much to be to take center stage if they do that in your team work what kind of physical environment do you have are you doing your learning inside the classroom or outside the classroom sometimes you know even conducting your session in the parking lot can just open up thinking of people 
all right and uh, can the learner choose whether he or she wants to use a certain type of equipment to learn do students learn better through online classes can the students say i'll learn this now and learn that later okay and and uh, how do students interact with the content that is given you give them a case study you give them a case study to learn or uh, to discuss in the classroom some students would say i would rather make a presentation out of it another student would say give me a chart paper and i will make a model out of that if you ever tried the case study learning method and given them the uh, you know a set of chart papers and markers they come out with beautiful models i've tried that and those models may manifest into so many different things so that's what constructive learning i mean uh, if you give them a short case list and uh, give them a set of old newspapers and say represent this case list to the news to newspaper models you see them making beautiful models some of them may pick up pick up words from those newspapers old newspapers some of them may use only the the paper to make uh, large uh, you know uh, large models so there are different ways in which the student can use his or or own talent that's the word i was looking for talent to bring home the learning or to bring home the content so this is what uh, some of the research on constructive learning is talking about and we are talking about it is the teacher and student you know talk to each other engage in dialogue as against only the teacher talking and the student being a passive learner or a passive uh, passive listener right and so uh friends i also wanted to go on to the next part where is saying that now that we look at cognitive uh, behaviorism cognitivism behaviorism and uh, uh, constructivism how do you synthesize each of these philosophies of learning into aligning them into uh, learning goals uh, the aligning them with what the learners are and what evaluation or assessment style are you using to uh, to fortify the learning uh, i think it's time for us to stop here in the next class we'll quickly look at how we align this and then we look at the lecture method of learning any questions here it's already 11:32 any questions anything that you would like to disagree with or uh, or uh, give a different fresh perspective new point of view i think we are good we good yeah uh, yeah let's have a cup of tea after this and move on to our next session uh, i hope i have been able to make sense today and uh, there were some of us who were very quiet i would rather that everyone speaks and in the next class because uh, yeah uh, otherwise it would be only four or five people talking and the others being passive listeners you wouldn't want that right so therefore in the next session which would be our my last session at least with you let's use the chat box a uh, chat box and let's have some session where everybody can talk i'll try to put all of you in breakout rooms in the next session all right yeah sure ma'am uh, yeah. sure ma'am have a nice day or like my thank friends you, thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you ma'am have a nice day thank, thank you. you thank you ma'am have a nice day thank you ma'am are you there yeah thank you have a nice day you. have a nice day thank you ma'am you will be sure are you there some of you quieted down after the first talk let's have more of you talking in the next session i'm ending the meeting over here yes thank you thank you bye bye thank you bye bye